Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation uh, and to our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those on all of these occasions who join us on our heritage.org website and remind them that you can send your questions or comments simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. And then, of course, we will post the program within 24 hours on our website for everyone's future reference as well. For those in-house, if you'll please be so kind to make that last courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off, it will be appreciated. Hosting our discussion today and introducing our special speaker is Dr. Stephen Bucci, director of our Douglas and Sarah Allison Center for Foreign Policy Studies. He is well versed in special operations, cybersecurity, as well as defense support to civil authorities. He served for three decades as an Army Special Forces officer and top Pentagon official, and upon retirement, continued at the Pentagon as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, Homeland Defense, and America's Security Affairs. Immediately prior to joining us here, he was a lead consultant to IBM on cybersecurity. Please join me in welcoming Stephen Bucci. Steve? Good morning, and let me add my welcome to all of you being here at Heritage. Uh, our subject this morning is no time to stand still, changing the paradigm, the paradigm of domestic counterterrorism. Uh, there are some folks in the country who think this issue is, is no longer germane. Uh, I really wish they were right, but unfortunately they're not. Uh, it is still an issue of concern. Uh, and I think our speakers this morning will give you a lot to think about in regard to that. Uh, before we have our panel, uh, I'm going to take the opportunity to invite a special speaker to come up and address us, uh, the Honorable Robert Pittenger, Republican of North Carolina, uh, is, has recently been named to a new post, and I'll let him refer to that uh, by the, the leadership in the House, uh, and he has a special uh, interest in this particular subject, and it's a real honor for us to have him here and have us uh, have him address us uh, before the panel begins. So, Congressman, thank you for joining us, and welcome to Heritage. Thank you, Steve. What a privilege it is to be at Heritage. I have uh, admired and followed and uh, participated with this wonderful organization for 30 years. I was close to some of the many wonderful people who helped start it. And we uh, are privileged, all of us, to benefit from the load that they carried to make sure that um, we had access to uh, real solid data and information that affects so much of our public policy in this country. So congrats to you. And thank you for what you're doing this week on the Homeland Security Week, particularly on No Time to Stand Still. And certainly this is no time to stand still. I think we saw that clearly from what took place in Boston, that tragedy that affected those who live in my own community. Uh, I woke up to an email uh, from a, a friend who, the person that trains them, had uh, their legs blown off. So, uh, you know, it gets close to home and you realize the, tra the travesty. And and the impact that is made upon our homeland and what shall be made. You know, years ago, we could pretty much forecast uh, we had mutual assured destruction. We had the Soviet empire that we were faced with, and that was the focus, was the threat of communism. And you had a pretty good grasp of what you could do to try to challenge that and mitigate uh, the issue. Today, it's much more complicated. It's much more convoluted uh, and, frankly, a, a much greater threat. Since I was in the state Senate, I was served three terms in the North Carolina Senate, uh, these concerns have been on my mind of what are the prevailing threats out there and particularly what can be done to protect the American people uh, regarding certain specific threats. So to that end, I um, worked with some very bright folk to write a preparedness manual. And this was uh, about 2004. And we uh, sent this manual out, probably a quarter million of them, got some sponsors to help put it together. And the Director of Homeland Security uh, wrote a letter uh, in support of it because it was frankly so critical to uh, 
inform people, I felt. I just, I really feel like that um, unless we're better prepared and better understand uh, those threats, um, we are very vulnerable. In the 50s, which most in this room would not understand, um, we built bomb shelters. And that was our mode of response to the possible threat of a, a nuclear bomb. And today it's far different. Uh, we don't, we have to look beyond the traditional aspects of war. So uh, expressing these concerns to the majority leader and to the leadership of the speaker, uh, they proposed that I chair the Congressional Task Force on Terrorism and Unconventional Warfare, a task force that Majority Leader Cantor uh, chaired for many years and then subsequent uh, to that is, uh, felt that this would be the right role that I could play. We frankly need more people out there. I've taken this to uh, Chairman Rogers, who's chairman of the Intelligence Committee. Uh, he has arranged some and, and more uh, briefings for our uh, committee uh, with many folks who are associated, uh, Mr. Bucci and others, uh, with the FBI and CIA and Homeland Security and DOD and others. Uh, we, we want to be well prepared, well versed, and then we want to be in a position to convey these concerns appropriately to the American people. Uh, the gravity is so severe. When you look at the strife and the civil war in Syria and the compounds that are available there today, if they were transported out of country and put on a boat by Hezbollah or whoever, shipped into Boston Harbor and blown up, you kill a quarter million people. That's conceivable. We have to be aware that so many things can happen. Had a very sobering discussion with Vice President Cheney about six weeks ago, spent an hour with him. Uh, one of the brightest people I've ever known, have greatest respect, and his staff have given some uh, very solid uh, direction and counsel to us and our, and our committee. So these things are on our mind. Um, we have to know that, there, that those that are out there are unrelenting. They're thinking about this right now. They are a jihad. President Obama commented a few weeks ago that the war of terror is over. Could there not be a more absurd statement? The war, terror, the war of terror is not over. This could not be a more sobering time. And that is why yesterday when we had a very important vote on NSA and what their capabilities should be in storing information, uh, there was an amendment to try to restrict that, essentially gut their abilities. Well, I've been down to the their intelligence room, their security room, and I've reviewed those 50-plus documents that cite uh, the threats. And clearly, there was an absolute uh, capacity that they had to try to foil those plots, and they did. And they utilized the information available to them because they had numbers that they could track. And what an irony, what a paradox that I don't understand that the phone book has more personal information about you than what they store. The Internet has more personal information about you than what they store. And uh, there are so many levels of accountability that is required in the NSA process. These are professional people. And sadly, I heard some comment that, uh, well, in the context of uh, what the Attorney General did and what uh, has occurred uh, through the IRS, we had to be wary of this. My dear friends, there's no comparison. Uh, those are political arms. Those are political machines. They exploited, they advanced the cause of the people that they work for, and these individuals are professionals. And they run a very professional operation, and they have accountability, accountability back to a court. So uh, I, I felt it somewhat absurd 
to make the context that, uh, well, you know, you have to look at all this together. We have a very professional organization in NSA, and every way that we can, I think it's incumbent upon us, yes, to protect our constitutional rights to privacy, and we've done that. But we also have a constitutional obligation to defend and protect this land. And I do not want the blood on my hand for what happens in this country uh, by imposing some uh, basis that is not, in my opinion, founded to not allow the NSA to do what they need to do. Um, this has been important work. And in reviewing those files becomes even more sobering of the realities of what could have happened. And that can yet happen today if we're not diligent. So we will remain diligent. We will remain focused on these issues. And I compliment you for being here, for pursuing um, the best interest of this country in, in terms of the national security requirements. And I thank Heritage for the continued role that they play to be out front uh, avant-garde. They are they're always there at the right place at the right time uh, getting us prepared for good policy for the good of this country. Thank you and God bless you. Got any questions or anything? Yeah, do you have any questions for the, the congressman? He's got a few minutes. He is uh, stuck between boats, so we have him for a little while. Boats and airplanes and if whatever. If he has questions, we'll be happy to just I'm write good. down there. Please identify yourself and please ask a question. <laughs> um, my name's uh, Okan Malik. I'm uh, an assistant professor at National Defense University from Islamabad, but I'm currently a senior fellow at SAIS, Johns Hopkins. Um, I've been working on counterterrorism for quite a while now, uh, as a national advisor on counterterrorism to uh, in Pakistan. Uh, but I'm originally from England. <coughs> I think you're right. There is no end to this terror, uh, from what I gather. I've been in the field, I've been in Afghanistan, a lot of other places. I limit this comment to the question. Um, however, a certain in-depth introspection needs to take place to, to the effect that terrorism has exploded upon the world in various aspects. I hope that's not the electromagnetic pulse. <laughs> <laughs> Blackberry, I'm sure. <laughs> They're all spineless. <clears throat> it's spread everywhere. Uh, now in Syria, in mm -hmm. Nusra, um, in various other parts of Africa and South Asia. Um, partially also to do with foreign policy, there's got to be an understanding, a more in-depth understanding exactly what, what may, basically feeds this and allows it to proliferate more so, rather than combat it just with kinetic power. Uh, a more intelligent design to combat it, in fact. And obviously that you're in that place to do that. Um, we're all here to help, I guess. Thank you for your comment. But it kind of crash and call. <laughs> Hi, I'm William Hakwa uh, from IJA International. We are an open source intelligence company that works with uh, various corporate clients around the world to help them uh, mitigate security risks. And I was wondering, uh, you're talking about working in, the, working in Congress to promote efforts to protect against domestic terrorism. What sort of work are you doing with uh, private companies um, what sort of advice are you giving them, and are there any recommendations for businesses to help protect themselves against this sort of threat? Well, cyber threats are among the greatest concern that we have today. And I think uh, businesses need to be counseled better. And of course, your, your major corporations are on top of this. Your banks, are um, they deal with this in a massive way every single day that they face this challenge, and they have... Uh, huge uh, elements in their organizations to try to address this. But in the broader context, even individuals need to be aware of uh, what can be done and what could be planted inside. What do you call those? I'm not a computer. You stick inside your computer? USB. 
USB. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what, what, what's implanted inside that stick? You know, that it's some time and some moment, uh, you know, it could create a tremendous amount of harm. Uh, it has enormous implications for uh, business and for our economy. Uh, and I think it's incumbent that we learn more, and that, frankly, that's the job I've taken on. And I've just taken on this job about three weeks ago. So uh, we will be about that. And, the, and our role is going to be, uh, frankly, in the communications business. There's a lot of people out there. I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's a lot of good people, Homeland Security and the Intelligence Committee and NSA and groups like yours and others that we will learn from. But my issue is going to be how do we translate that back to the American people, to businesses? What can they do? And, and that's the role that we've been asked to play. So a very good point. Well, thank you very much. I would ask the panel to come on up. Uh, I have to tell you, in, with regard to the congressman uh, getting this new position, uh, a lot of times people get leadership and they, they think, okay, I'm in charge, I know everything already. Uh, the first thing the congressman did was to reach out, not just to us, but to lots and lots of groups and say, hey, get me what I need, give me the information I need so I can do this job effectively. That's a nice feeling when you see someone take a leadership position like that. So uh, I, we wish you well, Congressman. Um, for everyone, uh, this is our fifth uh, Homeland Security Week here at Heritage, fifth year in a row we've done it during this time period. Uh, and I really wish I could say we've solved all the problems. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet, but that's because the nation hasn't gotten there yet. Uh, this subject is near and dear to my heart. Uh, the week of the Boston bombing, I get, went to New York to be in a conference on counterterrorism with a large group of law enforcement type folks. Uh, it was a pretty sobering couple of days right after this occurred. Uh, Boston was a reminder that the world is still a dangerous place uh, and there are people out there who wish us ill. Uh, our panel this morning, I think, is a good one. They are people that understand different aspects of this problem, and we've asked each of them to give us about 10 minutes or so of opening remarks, correct? Mm -hmm. All right, just yeah. double-checking since Jessica's really in charge. Uh, and then we're going to try and get to Q&A as quickly as possible after that to answer the questions that you might have. So to introduce our panel, we're going to begin with Ms. Uh, Jessica Zuckerman. Jessica works for me. She is my uh, lead policy analyst for the Western Hemisphere, which means she does homeland security for the United States and all of North America, and she handles all of Latin America as well. Uh, Jessica uh, started working here in 2009 at Heritage. She's done a, a myriad of different subject areas, uh, and her toughest task since she's been here was trying to get me integrated into the heritage system without falling on my face too often. Uh, so I appreciate it. She is a, a marvelously talented uh, analyst who I trust with everything that I do. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to have her. Next to her is Scott Erickson. Scott is a police officer from San Jose, California. Uh, Scott does regular patrol duty, but is also their counterterrorism liaison officer. And near and dear to our heart, he's a regular contributor uh, and, and partner with us here at Heritage, uh, and we're happy to, to have him with us. Uh, and then next to him is Dr. Jennifer Jacobs, who is a fellow at the Homeland Security Studies and Analysis Institute which is an uh, organization dedicated to, quote, transforming Homeland Security goals and objectives into meaningful strategies. Uh, very important to me is Jennifer is also a fellow graduate of the United States Military Academy. Uh, she was one of the smart ones, though. She became, you know, she got an engineering degree uh, and eventually got her Ph.D. in nuclear engineering. And she's also worked uh, as a senior member of the technical staff at Sandia National Labs. 
Uh, so all three of our, our panelists come at the, uh, the issue of counterterrorism from very different perspectives, and I think that will give us a well-rounded look at where we stand today. So we'll begin with Jessica. You can either speak from your seat or you can come to the podium, whichever you prefer. And then when they're done, I will moderate the Q&A period. And as I said before, if at the end of two sentences I don't hear a question mark, I'm going to stop you because if you really want to give a speech here, talk to me and we'll arrange for you to do a program, but don't do it from your seat. Thank you. Thanks. So my job today, besides telling Dr. Bucci what to do, as he already That's pointed right. out, is basically to set these guys up and give a little context for our talk today. Um, what I also want to talk about is this report. Hopefully you all got a copy of on your way in. Since 2007, we at Heritage have been tracking thwarted terrorist plots since 9-11. Surprisingly, actually, the FBI around that time called us to get our numbers. But um, what I want to talk about is in 2007, we reported there were 19 thwarted terrorist plots against the United States. This year, we reported there were 56. This year also, in light of what happened in Boston, we've decided to include terrorist attacks that were unfortunately successful. Um, and that has brought our number up of 60 terror plots against the United States, according to publicly available information, of course. I don't know if you still have a clearance, but the rest of us might not. Um, and these are publicly known Islamist-inspired terrorist plots since 9-11. Now, Boston came as a shock to many here in the United States. In part, it's because we haven't seen a large-scale successful attack since 9-11, thankfully so. The pendulum of awareness among the public has really swung back since that time. In part, it was also because of the nature of the attack. At least as far as the public was concerned, the idea that we would have an improvised explosive device, which is really what this pressure cooker was, at a public event was not something the American public had considered. We have to remember, however, that that was just one of the four successful attacks we have seen by our count since 9-11. In 2006, a gentleman drove an SUV into a crowd at UNC Chapel Hill. In 2009, there was a shooting at an Army recruiting office in Little Rock, Arkansas. And of course, most people are familiar with Major Nadal Hassan at Fort Hood in 2009. Few, oh, I said that part already. I'm getting ahead of myself. The fact is that we <coughs> really need to remember that the terrorist threat remains strong, and this war has not yet been won, as the congressman mentioned. I do want to say, however, the U.S. has come a long way since 9-11. Terrorist networks have been dismantled, training camps have been dispersed, and terrorist leadership has in large part been decimated. Internationally, we have an al-Qaeda that has become more decentralized and has led to greater dependence on its affiliate and allies. All of these things, coupled with increased domestic security, has made it harder for terrorists to carry out an attack like that we've seen on 9-11. By that, I mean a large-scale attack coordinated largely by more of the leadership from abroad. It is also meant, however, that terrorists have turned increasingly to domestic extremism here in the United States. Homegrown terrorism has an increased appeal because homegrown actors can often bridge the divide between the United States and other regions throughout the world. They largely know our culture, the language, and can generally move around more freely without drawing attention to themselves. Illustrating this, the fact of the 60 terrorist plots we've cited since 9-11, 49 of these could be considered homegrown. By that, I mean they were planned out or carried largely by either US-born citizens, naturalized immigrants, or other immigrants who were radicalized largely here in the United States. This, this is, proves an interesting challenge in large part for people like Scott. In some ways, you know, it's harder to detect these people exactly, and that's exactly the reason they're chosen. They can travel around, like I said, more freely. Um, it's a challenge that I'm going to let Scott address more later, but it's also something we need to remember is that the best thing we could do is stop plots early on. Um, make, and that points to some of the counterterrorism tools the congressman was talking about, making sure we have our essential counterterrorism tools, like the Patriot Act, like some of our NSA programs in place. It also points to the need to break down silos of information between the federal government and state and local individuals like Scott. Again, like I said, it's my job to set Scott up here to talk and give the context and make sure that we have state and local law enforcement at the table. The one other point I wanted to make about the homegrown threat is um, about a chart we have here in 
We also cite the citizenship of the number of the actors here, of about 154 people who are arrested. Interestingly enough, exactly half were U.S. citizens. After that, the next closest number is U.K. citizens with 33, and in large part those were all from one plot in 2006. After that, the next closest is Pakistani citizens with six. Those numbers are staggering, that we have 77 as a high, 33 as second, and then maybe six or five as our next average. But with that, I want to turn it over to Scott to talk a little more about state and local law enforcement and what he does. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Jessica. As Dr. Bucci uh, mentioned a moment ago, I am a police officer. I'm your typical beat cop. I work a streetcar. Uh, if you call 911, unfortunately, I show up. And <laughs> partly, part of what I do, though, ancillary to my regular duties, is I work in our terrorism liaison program. I'm not the only officer that does that. Fortunately, we're a large department. We have about 1,000 officers, and we have dozens of officers who participate in this program. But what the TLO program does, the Terrorism Liaison Officer Program does, is it puts uh, street-level police officers who are engaging in everyday activity with uh, the community in connection with either their own respective intelligence units or some sort of a local intelligence unit. And that information, whatever's gleaned from the streets, can then be passed on to that intel unit, which can then get forwarded on to either a joint terrorism task force, which is a collaborative effort between state, uh, local, and federal law enforcement, and or a fusion center, where this information can be actually analyzed and turned into something useful. Um, but I think it goes without saying that the state and local actors in the larger counterterrorism enterprise are vitally important. I don't think it was recognized pre-9-11. A lot of talk was made about quote-unquote connecting dots and stuff like that, and I think there were a lot of mis missed signals. But we understand today that it's important that state and local actors have a seat at the table, kind of like here today, um, and that their voice is heard. Homegrown radicalization is going to get is going to become a greater problem for us, in part because, as Jessica mentioned, Al-Qaeda Central has been fractured. It's a lot harder to organize and put together some sort of a, uh, a large-scale coordinated attack from overseas than it was pre-9-11. But what that leads you to are a lot of lone wolves, a lot of people who will take it upon themselves to either engage with bridge figures, uh, people like Anwar al awlaki who would uh, sort of be the he would act as the intermediary between the individual, say, here at home in the U.S., who wanted to be inspired to pursue jihad or something along those lines, uh, and the, uh, the romanticized version of what he, he believes in, which is occurring elsewhere, overseas. Uh, but as that becomes more prevalent, we're going to see more and more of that in our own communities. And each and every community has been affected by this. Uh, Jessica mentioned 60 plots since 9-11, there's way more than 60 plots. A lot of things occur in local communities that for either political reasons or administrative reasons, they don't want to characterize as having any kind of a link to jihad or to terrorism. And those aren't, are, have not been quantified, and they're very <coughs> difficult to quantify. But they exist and they occur. Um, so this problem's going to continue. It's going to continue affecting uh, all of us. but. One element, I think, of, of particular importance to state and local law enforcement is, is participating in what we call a suspicious activity reporting program. Now, you would think that is sort of second nature to cops. We report on suspicious activity. That's kind of what we do. But creating a system whereby street cops like me or others who engage with the public and might see something that they think is is relevant or has a nexus to terrorism, they can get that information in a very easy way over to either their own intelligence unit or to a fusion center or a local JTTF. And it's actually a lot harder than you think. Um, police officers like things to be easy. And if you tell them they have to fill out a three-page report for some little piece of you know, suspicious activity they saw, it may not happen. So what we use in the field for everyday encounters with people are called field inter interrogation cards, FI cards. And every police department uses these. And it's just a little card they take your information down on. That needs to be standardized specifically for information that may or may not have a nexus to terrorism so it can be passed on. 
And the government has tried to put, to put this together and tried to help coordinate this program through what's the Nationwide Suspicious Activity Reporting Initiative, which is attempting to standardize this process. And while on paper it might look that, might look like hundreds of law enforcement agencies are participating, and they are, and many have very good intentions, uh, sometimes that participation may not trickle down all the way to the line officer. And while I can probably think of no chief of police that wouldn't happily stand up and say, yes, we're part of the, uh, we're part of the, the you know, the nationwide counterterrorism enterprise, um, that's a very different thing than actually incorporating this mindset into the organizational and operational culture of a law enforcement organization. Uh, changing a culture in any organization is difficult, but it's especially so in law enforcement. We're pretty stubborn people and we don't like to change. So it takes direction from the top down to make that happen. And I see that as being one of the significant challenges that we face in the short term or the near term if we really want to incorporate the state and local actors into this enterprise in a more meaningful way. Um, so that's sort of a nutshell where I come from. I'm happy to answer any questions when we're done, but I will pass the microphone on now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Jacobs, and thank you for the introduction. I, I work uh, at, it's kind of a mouthful, Homeland Security um, Studies and Analysis Institute. We're a federally funded research and development center created by Congress to serve the Department of Homeland Security in doing studies and analyses for them as they look at uh, what kind of issues they need to study, mostly internally. As a result, we've had the opportunity to do a lot of analysis of of programs, equipment, um, behaviors at DHS. And one of the things that we have found is that oftentimes the results or the effectiveness or the performance of something is not necessarily as, as it's expected or as it's assumed to be. So what I'd like to talk briefly about today is the issue of applying metrics. And the word metrics I know makes your mind kind of kind of turn off a little bit. Um, so I, I, I I want you to think of this as very exciting, very interesting, because what I'm talking about is um, applying metrics to Homeland Security. And by that, I mean trying to understand how effective is the TSA scan that you go through when you get on an airplane. Um, how effective are the operators at looking at your suitcase to see if you have placed uh, a handgun or a knife or an IED in that suitcase? And that sounds maybe a little bit hard. H how do you measure how effective someone is at looking for a handgun? Um, this, is, this, is, uh, this is where it may be interesting to me and less so to other people because I'm a geek. But, um, but there are, so there are ways to do that and there's, there's actually a number of interesting ways to do those kinds of things. Those kinds of measurements where we measure effectiveness of equipment or effectiveness of people or programs are, are relatively straightforward in the world of, of measurement and metrics. For example, um, radiation portal monitors, which you, you may or may not know anything about, they're, they're sort of like, they sort of look like a metal detector, but they detect radiation emanating from something that goes between them. These are in use all over the United States, especially by um, entities like Customs and Border Patrol, but elsewhere as well. And we also use them internationally. The United States has placed some internationally and, and is working in co collaboration. But we have them um, a lot of locations domestically. Congress has dictated to CBP in particular that everything that comes into the country <coughs> should be scanned by, uh, for example, should be scanned by a radiation portal monitor. Also that it should be scanned by x-ray imaging equipment as well. Under the impression, I, I suspect, of wanting to protect the country, and it sounds good to say we'll scan 100% of what comes into this country in cargo containers or in vehicles or people coming off of people coming across the border. Um, this, the implementation of this was scheduled for, I believe it was July of 2012. Luckily, the Secretary of the Homeland Security was given the power to delay this in two-year increments uh, with no limit to how many two-year increments because it's actually, so you can, you can have free and flowing commerce and a functioning world economy with the United States involved, or you can scan 100% of the things coming into the US. You can pick one of those things. You cannot have both um, at this point in time, certainly, and in any point in the future, because if you were actually to do that 100% scanning, you would effectively stop commerce. 
and we would feel those effects um, instantly, and they would be much more severe than, than any terrorist attack we've seen so far. And this is widely recognized, and so that's why it has not been implemented. But if we were able to actually implement it, we wouldn't find that we would have what we thought we had. Because radiation portal monitors, and I'm just using a couple examples here because um, that's what I've been absorbed in lately, but there are many more examples. Radiation portal monitors and x-ray imaging technologies, um, the millimeter wave technology that you go through at the airport, these are not 100% technologies, and they're not even close, I, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Um, and so you can, you can see, hopefully, the importance of understanding how effective are they. What are we getting for the hundreds of millions of dollars that we're spending deploying these? It might be worth what we're spending. It might not be, I don't know, but it might be better to take those hundreds of millions of dollars and put them into state and local law enforcement. It could be if we were to measure the effectiveness of state and local law enforcement for the purposes that we're concerned with, preventing terrorism in this case. It might be that money would be better used there and we would actually save more lives um, by putting the money somewhere else. Or maybe not, maybe we should buy more of this equipment. So you can see there that it isn't an argument to do or not do something. It's an argument to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it. And that usually develops as you have the discussion about how. So the equipment stuff is interesting um, and fairly straightforward. People's performance is simply fascinating, in my opinion. Um, you, how many people here have heard of the invisible gorilla experiment? Has anyone heard of this? This is, OK, good. We got a couple takers in the back there. So this is, if you go on Google or go on YouTube and, you, and you, you type in invisible gorilla basketball passing experiment, you'll find it and you can watch it and it's, it's, it's really cool. Um, I recommend that you, that you, well now you're going to know because I'm going to tell you, but tell your friend and have your friends do these without knowing. It's a, it's a small psychology experiment that um, a couple researchers did in the late 90s. It's become very famous now and it measures inattentive blindness, which is simply put, someone's ability to look right at something, so a TSA scanner's ability to look right at the handgun you put blatantly right in your suitcase and not see it because he wasn't looking for it, because he was looking for a knife, because she was looking for an IED, because he or she was thinking about something else. Um, in this invisible gorilla experiment, the viewer the, the person who's being evaluated or tested in that evaluation, is asked to count how many people, how many times the players in white pass the basketball. And they focus on, it can be a bounce pass, it can be an air pass, so, so your attention is on people in white shirts passing a basketball. There's three people in white shirts, there's three people in black shirts. So they do it, they, they show them a video, you're counting very carefully because you want to be good, everyone here wants to be a good student, right? And in the middle of this thing, uh, a student, it's, it's a student because all these experiments are done with students, right, because they're cheap. Um, <laughs> in a full-on, full-body gorilla suit, walks on the stage in the middle of the basketball players, passing, they continue passing, beats her chest, and stays for nine full seconds on the screen, and then exits. And at the end of the, and then they continue the basketball thing, that's going on the whole time. At the end, they ask how many basketball passes were there and whatever the answer is. It doesn't matter, of course, because then they say, did you see anything unusual while you were watching? And fully half of people who do this, like normal people like you and me, smart people, do not see the gorilla. And a lot of times when people are then shown or told there was a gorilla and then someone is shown back the video, they're either flabbergasted that they missed it, because how can you miss a gorilla walking in the middle of the scene? And two, uh, sometimes they, they insist it wasn't there. And, and perhaps Scott has run into this with eyewitness testimonies and accounts, and they're, you know, we're hearing more and more about them being completely wrong. It was, uh, the DC sniper was reported to be driving in a, around in a white panel van, right? And it turned out to be a blue, like, Caprice, I think. Um, so this is fascinating, but there are, of course, ways to measure it from the straightforward to just test people and evaluate their performance to getting into a lot of the, the psychology experiments. But this is what a lot of our security hinges on, is there's a person in, in the middle. There's a person screening, there's a person deciding, there's a person evaluating, and we all have the same kind of a brain, and it works the same kind of a way. And so it's important to understand that and to decide how much 
we should put into training, how much we should put into trying to automate equipment to find things for us and how well that works, and how much we should perhaps rely on something else. That's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about metrics and applying metrics to Homeland Security. Um, when we evaluate programs, we get into lots of techniques that are fairly well known, like surveying for things where you're trying to affect the public. Uh, D Department of Homeland Security has a ready business campaign where they're trying to prepare private businesses to be able to respond in an emergency or a terrorist event. And things like that can be easily evaluated with some kind of survey or some kind of assessment. Um, there's a lot of red teaming, uh, which of course, if you're not familiar with red teaming, is, is sort of like role playing, like secret shopper. You can think of secret shopper, role playing uh, um, techniques as the same thing as a red team where they use it often in cybersecurity where they, they hire good guys to pretend to be bad guys to see what kind of flaws they can have. They use these in protecting nuclear, nuclear power facilities as well. And you can do these, uh, TSA does use this. Um, a TSA actually does a, a decent job of, of testing themselves, which um, we have to give kudos to them for that. There's a lot more they could do, and um, there's a lot more a lot agencies in DHS could do if they're given the resources and the support to do that. Um, but all of these things allow us to do a cost-benefit analysis of where should we put our finite resources, because ultimately our resources are finite. Whether it's time or money or energy or attention, um, they're finite, and even, especially in the climate that we're facing now where our, our, specifically our financial resources are being drawn down, it forces us to make some decisions about what's really important. And in deciding what's really important, it's helpful to know what really works and what doesn't work as well, and to, to put our resources towards what actually works. Now there's something else that's fascinating, and I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll just tell you this one last thing that I think is fascinating, and then I'll stop. Um, there's, there are several studies, maybe there's more than several, but several that I've read about the post 9-11 impact of the fear of flying. And by some assessments, between 1,000 to 2,000 people died, 1,000 to 2,000, there were 1,000 to 2,000 excess deaths post 9-11 because of the fear of flying. People who, uh, statistically, now of course you never know any individual person, but statistically there are a well, let's just use the number 1,500 to keep it simple. There are about 1,500 more traffic deaths in the year or two following 9-11 than statistically would have been expected. And of course, there's uncertainties there, but we'll leave those aside for now. And the theory is people were afraid to fly enough that they drove instead in greater numbers such that because driving is frankly one of the most dangerous things that we do, um, that we lost an additional about 1,500 people because of that. Flying, even with the terrorist events, um, is a safer form of transportation than driving, statistically. So what does that mean? Because we don't want to say, well, then we don't care about terrorism because driving is dangerous. That's not the point. The point is, it is actually valuable and it actually saves lives to assuage people's fears about flying. So if, in fact, uh, we're assessing the value of, we'll say, TSA, TSA checks and inspections, and having to take off your shoes, um, not being allowed to take your pocket knife on the plane. We could, I'm not saying this is the case because I, I, we haven't done this assessment, but we could find out, theoretically speaking, that, that those checks have no value whatsoever, that anyone who's so inclined could get their pocket knife past screening. That doesn't actually mean that they're not valuable. And uh, here, because of this issue of making people uh, more comfortable with flying, if they feel safer, they're more likely to fly. Th so there was another fascinating study done with college students, again, thank you for college students, um, in which they were uh, agreed to participate in, a, in an experiment. And half the group was told that uh, they, were, they were going to participate in an experiment in which they would receive an electric shock. Uh, I'm sorry, which they might receive an electric shock. It would be painful, but not dangerous. So we're not going to kill you in this experiment. But it would be <laughs> quite painful, but short. So half the group was told, your chance of getting this electric shock, because you might get it, you might, you might not get it, but you're, you, you're, so far you're in the experiment. Um, your chance of receiving electric shock is 99%. So quick math, you're going to get the shock, right? Um, the other group was told, your chance of getting the electric shock is 1%. So 
so you're not getting except for one, one maybe one bad luck person. Um, you have the opportunity to pay to get out of the experiment. What will you pay? So the interesting thing is to see how much difference. One group has 99 times the probability of getting the electric shock. Will they pay 99 times as much to avoid the chance of getting it? Now, these are college students, so the going rate was $10 to get out of the experiment. Um, so so the, the people who are going to have 99% chance of getting it, almost sure, would pay $10 to get out of it. The people who had almost no chance of getting the shock still paid $7 to get out of it. And this study, and this is, and they repeated it with other things, uh, you know, a theoretical chance of getting cancer, you know, with different kinds of uh, emotional images associated with it. And they found that when facing what they're calling a fearsome risk, so very scary, terrifying, so like terrorism, very fearsome risks, people don't include probability in what they'll do to avoid it. So driving, it's not scary. I do it every day. Some people do it while texting, right? Like some people do it while sort of sleeping. It's not <laughs> scary. And so even though it's very dangerous, we don't pay anything to get out of it. We prefer to drive rather than take the metro, which is safer. Um, but scary things we will try to get out of even when they're not gonna, they're, they're almost certainly not gonna happen to us. And so the point of all that is that's worth something. It's worth something to understand what it's worth to, in this case, the American public, to not be, whatever level of scared matters to us, to not be so scared. To not be scared to open your mail. To not be scared to fly. To not be scared to go to a marathon. That's worth something. Because I calculate the risk of someone actually stealing one of my children out the backyard, and it's astronomically low. But that doesn't mean I don't watch them like a hawk, right? because the consequences are horrible. And that's how our human brains work, that's how we work. I, as a scientist, know these things and I still behave the same way pretty much everyone else does. So that's the kind of thing um, that I think is enormously valuable to try to measure. We don't have to measure 3.1422. We just have to sometimes know, is it bigger than a bread box or smaller than a bread box? That's better than knowing nothing. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. All right, um, we're going to do some Q&A, so we got our microphone folks up and going, and I'm going to ask the first one, um, so you can think up yours. Uh, this is sort of a generic one, but what is the most likely terrorist event that you think we should look for here in the immediate future, and from who? Who was talking about statistics? Go first, right? Probability. <laughs> I would have to look at the data. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just when you got to, you got to do the impulsive thing, not the metrics um, one. You know, from what I hear from Jessica, and uh, from what I not not having data in front of me because I like data, it seems like it's a it's the small uh, person who's who's acting on their small small in number group. Mm -hmm. um, Who's acting on their own with some kind of um, some kind of grievance of their own imagining? Um, I'll actually draw off what you were saying earlier. So you talked about the threat of flying and the fear of flying. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, flying was fifth or sixth. Airplanes were the fifth or sixth. Fifth. Thank you. See, he looks at me. I look at Elizabeth. The fifth most prevalent target out of these 60 plots, fifth. And most people would probably say that's the most likely target. Now, obviously, the most likely one most people could guess once I ruled out airplanes is New York City, or the most common one, I should say, based on this. But I think it's exactly right. It's the risk that we don't perceive of being the highest. It is the events like Boston that people didn't think about, where one man could walk in this 20-mile radius, right? How long is a marathon? I don't run unless chased. Anyone? 26. Okay. This large radius of with tons of people coming and going, and it's the things the American public don't perceive as a threat. Yeah. Um, I'll just say I don't run unless I'm chasing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm certainly not chasing anyone 26 miles. But I don't, I don't know what would be the most likely scenario. But what concerns me the most, and what has concerned me the most as a, as a street-level police officer, is 
either one individual or a small group of people with small arms going into a mall, going into a school. We've seen it happen on sporadic occasions already, but somebody with a political motive doing that can render tremendous destruction in a short period of time. And fortunately, we in the law enforcement community, um, following Columbine and after 9-11 as well, have adopted a uh, have adopted the understanding that it's going to be us who's going to go have to go in and deal with it. Us being the street cop, not the SWAT team. There's no time when there's an active shooter to wait for the SWAT team to come because too many people will be killed. So something along those lines happening, either uh, either a coordinated attack where you hit multiple targets in one city at one time. You hit a, a hotel. You hit a school. You hit a some movie theater. At the same time, just deplete all the resources uh, for that jurisdiction. That's what concerns me the most. I don't know if it's uh, the most likely thing to happen next, but uh, I can see that being one of the worst things that could happen. Okay. All right. Questions from the audience? All right. Jump down here. Franklin. This is a question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited. Uh, from one geek to another. <laughs> And, and I'd like to include Scott, Scott in this. Uh, it's a nice balance of tactical to strategic issues. Mm -hmm. And I tend to deal with more of the strategic side. Um, you mentioned, and I've read, and I've been hearing a lot about this, that there's, and you just mentioned again, um, that there's some type of political motive which tends to be strategic in issue, from policy analysis, understanding what's going on outside. And you just asked the question, what would be the most likely attack? Isn't this one way of understanding what the next potential attack may be? Because you're looking at a different angle rather than just some tactical issues, getting um, an understanding of what's going on outside and who could be affected inside the country who may go as a long wolf. I mean, what is the probability of that? Or what is your analysis on that? Uh, relating the two, understanding the larger picture and how that affects people on the ground to do what they do. I, I think I, you I hit that. I, made I, I think I get it. Um, I think you made a very good point, though. Understanding the nature of the threat, understanding the environment we're operating in. I can look at this data all day long, but in and of itself, it won't tell me enough without understanding the bigger picture. And I think that's probably something you could speak to better than I, because I'm not at least a geek when it comes to numbers. Now, terrorism data, I got down. But other than that, I think you make an incredible point that connecting those two is very important. Unfortunately, it's also very hard. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just say this. I, I think it is extraordinarily hard to try and predict who is going to be the next uh, radicalized individual. I think from the perspective of law enforcement, we have to be aware of and open to seeing the signs and symptoms of radicalization when we encounter people for the brief periods of time we encounter them. Uh, friends and family, those are the folks who really have to be aware and cognizant of what's going on. And I can tell you, as I don't have to tell you this, but I've experienced so many times you go to a home and deal with some sort of a domestic issue uh, where a child or a teenager's acting incorrectly. And, uh, <laughs> The parents are just oblivious to it. As an outside party, I can look at it unemotionally and say, look, your kid's doing drugs, your kid's going down the wrong path, but the family can't accept that, and they don't want to accept it. And the same goes when you're dealing with people who are along that uh, continuum of radicalization. You know, they're slowly, gradually getting, getting more radical, and at what point are they going to turn to becoming operational and actually want to do something violent? That's very difficult. It's very difficult to predict. Uh, but we really need to pound at home the message that uh, family, friends, if you truly care about your loved ones, you have to be receptive to these signs and symptoms. As a street cop, again, it's just a matter of us uh, understanding what to look for, documenting it when we can, getting it into the hands of the folks who can actually analyze it and do something with it. Yeah, I, I think, I, I agree, I think it's folly to try to predict who or, or, or what the next attack would be. Certainly we can say, uh, as Jessica did, what you know, what have what have been targets and what have been likely targets statistically. Um, one of the things that I've been involved with is trying to understand 
threat for particular purposes, where is someone going to try to smuggle nuclear weapons into the country? Where is someone going to try to use them? But, but you can only do that on, on a, a larger scale. You can't do that on an individual scale because if it happens that my brother-in-law works in the loading dock of this freight yard, then I'm more likely to use that freight path, whereas Scott would have chosen a different path because he has different access, he has different knowledge. And, and so t that's a game that you're, you're only going to win by sheer luck. Instead, I think what's useful is to try to see what the trends are, what seem to be, um, what seem to be things that are um, causing people to be radicalized. Why is, it, why is it that we're focused on Islamic terrorism, but Jessica tells us that 90% of our domestic terrorism events have been perpetrated by US and UK individuals, if I heard you correctly. So that's a fascinating statistic. Um, perhaps that kind of thing will help us direct our efforts. What, the next layer down on that is why, what, what was happening with those individuals, such that they grew up in the country that we think, in the two countries that we think would share our values, but they clearly didn't. And so uh, if we can start to understand that, perhaps it will bring out some trends. Perhaps it won't. Perhaps uh, this is departing from pure terrorism, but it is pure terror, I'm sure, to be involved in a school shooting. Many of those, um, I believe, are involving people who are largely mentally ill. And that's something that, how could you possibly predict? Um, now maybe you could, maybe someone who's close to the person can predict it, and there we could uh, measure the effectiveness of, dare I say, of, of programs where we involve the public. And we say, how many of these have involved someone who gave a report to local police or federal police? How many of our incidents where we have um, thwarted uh, a potential attack, whether it be terrorist or a technically defined terrorism or just mass crime, how many of those are by someone who is close to the person? recognizing symptoms and speaking up, and how often, this is fascinating, that someone who walks in not close to the person recognizes it, and the people close to the person are too close and couldn't recognize it. And it would be, it would be, it would be fascinating to understand those nuances to see if there's anything re revelatory there. And not to make our answer to this go on forever, but I, I want to make two more points. For one, um, while we talk about how incredibly hard it is, it's important to point out that 53 of the 56 thwarted parts were thwarted by U.S. or international intelligence and law enforcement early on before folks were in danger. We had a few where the keen awareness of the public, take Times Square, for instance, the guy noticed the car smoking and pointed it out, did thwart that. But those aren't the majority of cases. I also want to draw on something Jennifer said, because I totally dorked out at that moment, <laughs> was when she started talking about this requirement we have from Congress for 100% screening of cargo. This exists for maritime and air cargo, and it's not just restricted to cargo. We also require 100% interview of everybody applying for a visa, each and every person, regardless of risk. That's kind of our... <laughs> That's my point. Um, that our knee-jerk reaction is, well, we're scared. We're going to just blanket everything with security. That makes us less secure. There is no way, which is what Jennifer was saying, we can protect against every threat. We need to be targeting this based on risk, using the skills we have developed well, using these intelligence tools to screen the shipments that come from suspicious sellers, the people who have suspicious backgrounds and are applying for visas. Not, you know, a grandma trying to go to Disney World if there's no reason to suspect her. Okay. There. In this age of internet, is the term lone wolf being abused when it's so easy to conspire with others? Probably, yeah. I would say yeah. yes. I, I'm, I think th there are still lone wolves out there, someone who just all by themselves dreams up some idea, but the I think we discount the ability to radicalize, even if the people are not in contact, like trading emails. If you're just reading the, the propaganda, reading the information on websites, and that radicalizes you, in my mind, you're still, you know, you're, you're following the commander's intent, to use the military terminology. Even if the commander didn't issue it to you personally, you read what he said and you acted on it. 
in my mind, you're essentially a part of that organization at that point. So I think we, we don't need to throw out the term lone wolf, but we need to make sure we adjust it because in Boston, you saw people having this debate, well, were they part of an organization or were they just lone wolves? Like the fact that you're just a lone wolf made you less dangerous when you put the bomb in the crowd. Uh, I, I think we just need to adjust it for this additional uh, communications capability we have. Anybody else want to add to that? Or, no? Okay, the red shirt. Hi, my name is Brett Ramsey with the Headless Society. Um, my question is, Mr. Erickson, you were talking about field interrogation cards, and you said that you passed those along to the federal government, correct? Um, Not okay. exactly what well, I said. What do, you, what do you do with those after you fill them out in the field? Well, the field interrogation card is, is a card this size, and it's simply something you take someone's information down on, whether or not you, th you shred it and get rid of it at the end of your shift, you use it to write your report later, what have you. Um, that's completely separate from the sp suspicious activity reporting that we were talking about that has a nexus to terrorism. That information, if it was a similar type form, if it existed or where it exists, could be transferred to your own department's intelligence unit. And then from the intelligence unit, the intelligence investigators can then decide whether or not that information will be passed on to a local JTTF, the FBI, or what have you. Every, um, every respective organization has its own uh, collection and storage requirements. And I just don't want to make sure you, you see the distinction between the basic street level uh, field interrogation card and what we were talking about with respect to the suspicious activity reporting. I will um, point out we do have a lot of information sharing where state and locals are expected to send suspicious materials up the chain. Um, one of the big issues we have is it doesn't really flow both ways um, in most regards. That same requirement isn't usually honored going the other way. There, there are programs, however, like EPIC and things like that where local people can reach out and say, hey, I, I'm seeing this. Is there any nexus out there? But it's more of a pull at that point rather than push the information down so people can look preemptively. We've got to get that flow going in a lot of sectors and in, in, in all the directions. All right, next question. Over in the corner there, and then who's, we'll get you next. Okay. Hi, how are y'all? Um, I got a question about the border and concerning, uh, it's a hot topic at this point, how much of a threat terrorism-wise really is the border uh, as we have this discussion about immigration reform possibly and one of the big sticking points uh, has been, you know, the border needs to be secure for economic reasons as well, but especially concerning, for y'all's opinion, the, uh, the border concerning uh, terrorism. Um, you know, I think we have seen a degree of terrorist activity. We saw the plot um, that was meant to assassinate the Saudi ambassador that had a nexus between Mexico and Iran. We've seen increased movements of Iran in the Western Hemisphere in Latin America and Hezbollah. Um, but I really think the point that can be made off of that is when we're talking about border security, when we're talking about this debate, we do need to think about the broad variety of issues we're talking about, not just illegal immigration, but drug trafficking and other violence. We want to put this in a broader context of what we're talking about. You also need to remember that and something I think is forgotten in this debate a lot is that the threat on the border change each and every day. So if we were to s declare the border secure tomorrow, it might not be the next day. And that's really an important thing we should be taking forward in this debate. Scott, you, know. uh, you know what? I, I don't have to work, obviously, closely with the border. Um, but I think you have to look at it from the perspective of if, if you're capable or people are capable of pushing billions of dollars worth of drugs over the border without being detected. If people are capable of engaging in human trafficking, either for the sex trade or what have you, and they aren't caught, then you can just as easily smuggle in human beings for terrorist purposes. So I think it is a significant, it's a significant uh, element of the, of the larger counterterrorism enterprise that we have to deal with. I, so I don't know the answer, but I think that would be a fascinating question to study. <laughs> Yeah, and that's that is the the interesting part. I'm I'm not a geek, but the the I I had I did learn well. <laughs> I uh, I have learned the importance of metrics, and that 
you really waste a lot of time and effort if you don't do the kind of studies that, that uh, was mentioned. You, you have to study that to figure out where your assets are really going to go. But you can't just do the quantitative analysis. There's a large, you know, analytical piece that's, you know, from your gut and it's from your intellect as well. But you've got to add that in, the cultural things that it, it's not all cut and dry. Uh, if, if you really want a nuanced view of, of the issues at the border, go down and talk to some of the CBP people that work on the border. Uh, it's a, frankly a much more informed conversation than you'll find here in most places in Washington uh, because they have to live with it. And you know they're enforcing U.S. law, they're doing the best they can, but they recognize they're in a context where the vast majority of people that they're dealing with are just people coming here looking for work, looking for a better way of life. But unfortunately, mixed in with them are significant numbers of bad guys that are trying to do terrible things of all sorts of ilk along the way. So it, it is a danger, uh, but it's, it's, it's just a tough, very, very nuanced uh, set of issues. The gentleman right here. I guess this is mostly for Cadet Scott, but when you're responding to a call or something and you're, you know, scoping the scene and everything, what are what are some indicators that might tip you off that maybe this act of this a criminal act is something that, you know, may lead to a terrorist attack or is possibly, let's say, like a drug bust or, you know, you you know, human trafficking bust. Um, you know, what are things you may look for for an attack or possibly connections to terrorist financing? Well, I mean, it's varied. Sometimes it's literature that you find around the house. Sometimes it's the, the layout of the home. Um, it can be the rhetoric that the individuals are using when addressing you and talking to you. There's all sorts of subtle nuances that you can pick up on. And I can tell you that sometimes you, you get a feeling about something and you pass the information on to the intel unit, and the intel unit thanks you for it, and that's the end of it. Um, it goes nowhere, and appropriately so, uh, many times. But there, there's just a series... That when I alluded to earlier, the terrorism liaison officer program, many departments throughout the nation are using this now, some more so than others. But officers who engage in that program, and it's typically a collateral assignment for most patrol officers, um, you go through a series of uh, training courses put on by DHS and or other regional intelligence uh, units, and it, they give you sort of the the more in-depth knowledge of what, what specifically you're looking for, what literature, what kind of language you're looking for, literally how the layout of a home is, is and what's in the refrigerator, things like that. It might seem kind of odd, but if you've studied uh, terrorist cells, you've studied individual terrorists, you've looked at the way they live, uh, and you look at how they um, live their life in many respects according to their very fundamentalist interpretation of the Quran, then... Uh, that can tip you off, and that can be the, the little bit of information you have that you pass on. And again, from there, it probably will go nowhere, and appropriately so, but uh, maybe there is something there, and that's the kind of information you just want to make sure that the street-level cop is armed with uh, and capable of getting to the next level. Just, uh, before I do this, the, I had a law enforcement colleague who told me that their job got really hard when they realized that every time they walked into a kitchen, they had to decide whether the, the person was just a really poor housekeeper or whether they had a ricin lab going because they look alike. <laughs> um, so that, that really makes law enforcement's job tough. All right, other questions? All right, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to ask a dual question. I'd like each of you to answer it, and this will be sort of your wrap-up so you can throw in anything else you want included in it. First, what's the most important thing we can do to better secure the homeland in this counterterrorism context? And you can look at that from either as individuals or as a society. And then the last one, which is one of my favorites, is is terrorism a law enforcement issue or is it a national security issue? And you can take that one any direction you want as well. Well, I actually got that first question a lot in the interviews we were doing after Boston. Well, what do I do? What can I do? 
Um, I think that there's two things. For one, it's just being aware of your surroundings. Scott kind of talked about what it's like to be cop on the beat. The, you, know, you know your surroundings better than a lot of DHS officials or some counterterrorism officials, and you know when something's not quite right. It might be nothing, but it's important to pay attention. The second biggest thing you can do is have a plan with your family for any kind of incident, whether it's a natural disaster or a terrorism incident. If you're prepared, that's one less person the law enforcement or the first responders have to take care of, um, and that's an important thing to remember. For those of us who are here during the earthquake, none of the cell phones worked, nobody knew where to find their family. There, there's things like that that we don't think about we can prepare for. The last question's harder, but I think it's both, and that's a cop-out of an answer, but it, it requires cooperation between our national security, between our intelligence, and between our law enforcement officers all around to help create a more secure nation, so. Yeah, I would, uh, taking the second question first, I'll, I'll also cop out and say that it is both, but uh, you look at a case like the GIS case in LA in 2005, it has elements of both um, <clears throat> traditional street crime uh, with robberies and, and what have you in order to fund a, a subsequent terrorist act. So it's not, it's not something that you can really just you know, cut down the middle with a, a you know, very bold line and say it's one or the other. I think it is both. Um, regarding the first question, what's the most important thing we can do? And it's silly to tell people in here or even people who are watching on the Internet because you are all the folks who care enough to actually go out of your way to listen to these things and talk about these issues. But... <laughs> Um, it's awareness. It's all about awareness. Being aware of your surroundings, yes, but being aware of what can happen, what's capable of happening, what has happened, understanding history, um, all those things. And that's, I think, what, what folks here at the Heritage Foundation do remarkably well, which is getting all that information out there and disseminating it in such a way that the public can digest it. Because unless we're aware of what's capable, of what's potentially going to happen, we're not going to be prepared for it. So, um, so I'll, I'll just put a little twist on it rather than just saying both. I agree with that, but, but I'll add a third, because I don't think it's a cop-out. I think it's true. There are obviously <laughs> elements of both national security and law enforcement to terrorism. But I'll add a third, which is I think it's also a, a public citizenry issue. Um, and what I mean by that is it isn't just law enforcement's problem, and it isn't just national security in terms of whether that's intelligent community or, or the other apparatus. To a certain extent, it's a public's problem. It's the it's a citizen's problem to decide how we want to handle this, what we want to have, what we want to accept, and what we won't accept. And that leads into then your other question about what's the most important thing we can do, which is I think have a well-framed public discussion with as so now I'm going into my geek mode, of course, but less rhetoric and more more understanding of exactly what we want in terms of effectiveness, what works, what doesn't work, what is okay, what, getting back to the discussion about fear, understanding that we may not save as many lives doing a certain program as a different program, but that it buys down our fear and that we value that, if that's the case. And I would love to see us as a nation have that discussion and say, these are the things we value, these are these are the things we're willing to pay for, and this is something that effectively gets us that. And these are other things that are not effective or that we don't value as much or we're willing to accept that risk. Okay. Well, I would ask you to join me in thanking our panel uh, for being here. <laughs> and would ask each of you to keep in mind that this subject is still ongoing. There is still a threat. I think the discussion made that pretty obvious. Uh, and we need to continue to deal with it as a nation and as individuals. Thank you very much for being with us.